the neurocritical care well i don't know whether uh, you know the too many experts so many experts talking on everything and i have got the tough job of amalgating everything and uh, wherever i'm stuck i'll take i'll ask the experts so so why do the patients come to the intensive care they come to neurocritical care primarily because of altered mental status altered level of consciousness is a non specific symptom and symptoms of many complications in neurocritical care when they come to us so they can be post operative bleedings raised icps ischemia vasospasm uh, retraction injuries tension pneumocephalus csf problems hyperperfusion syndromes and metabolic disorders like hypoglycemic seizures electrolyte and osmolality abnormalities hypercarbia hypoxia toxins drugs delirium hypotension hepatic encephalopathy so what is the essence the essence is the speed with which we work we the essence is to decrease the secondary injury and uh, treat the cause and prevent secondary injury so delay in diagnosis causes significant morbidity and mortality it increases the cost and it prolongs the ic stay and overall hospital stay so efficient crisis management of patients aims to identify and treat reversible causes before irreversible brain damage ensues thus even prior to rapid neurological examination your abc is important the history of the patient is important unspecific signs headache vomiting lethargy stupor tremors should be noted right investigation should be ordered and the right labs should be ordered so your general examination sorry the general examination comes first then your neurological examination appropriate labs and obviously depending on whether it's a diffuse injury or your focal injury or imaging sets in then so airway management is something which we all as intensivists would deal day in and day out and we would also ensure adequate oxygen supply and intubation and mechanical ventilation if necessary so we have to correct hypovolemia as appropriate hypotension with vasopressors or fluids consider treatment of hypertension if it is there and obviously call our surgical colleagues and our neurologists whenever it is needed so the key points are any change in level of consciousness has to be indicated perform clinical assessments perform frequent neurological scorings careful documentation if scores are deteriorating obviously the right people need to be called depending on the results perform future diagnostic tests and develop a unit specific standard operating procedure for patients with an altered or deteriorating level of consciousness so the airway cared for are, uh, under urgent or emergent circumstances in neuro icu setting is several magnitudes more complicated than a typical elective surgical patient presenting in a or for a procedure so we work in difficult circumstances we have patients with tbi strokes status metabolic septic encephalopathy meningitis encephalitis hydrocephalus edema and obviously they are not they are all agitated belligerent uncontrollable anxious patients with facial significant uh, with uh, significant facial traumas hypoxia hypercarbia limited airway examination is available positioning is difficult secretion vomitus all is there and the hardware the halo vest and things collars don't help either so conventional and advanced airway equipment sometimes we fall short with them abbreviated incomplete gathering of medical history is there as the patient comes to us in an emergency situation no time to review available or previous medical records and previous difficult airway encounters are not recorded and then to add on to it there are other harbingers of raised icp herniation certain patterns of breathing are associated with specific locations these patterns are often seen in succession over minutes to hours and culminating in death very very quickly if not addressed so as we know that different kind of uh, respirations the chain stoke respiration uh, 
changing ventilatory pattern that alternates between hyperventilation and hypoventilation, apneotic breathing by long respiratory pauses, cluster breathing is a, a group of quick breaths and ataxic breathing, complete loss of rhythmicity in breathing. They all aim at some sort of pathology. If you look at uh, the breathing pattern, they would, they would, I, I'm uh, sorry the slide isn't too clear, but each kind of breathing is pathognomic of some sort of lesion. And then the airway assessment needs to be done, uh, uh, one, only, one not only for intubation, but also for your bag mask ventilation. The seal of the mask needs to be good, obesity, age, teeth, stiff lungs, and obviously you look for uh, evaluation, the, evaluating the mouth opening, the malampatti scoring, obstruction, neck, mo uh, neck, uh, uh, neck mobility, and obviously also your aids like the patients might have collars on or cervical spine injury, intracranial hypertension, brain ischemia. Enlist expert help if you need to. In, uh, manual inline stabilization in C-spine injuries, no cricoid pressure in this subset of patients. Do not delay emergent intubations, awake fiber optic if you have the time, and consider the new toys like the video laryngoscopes and things. You, remember, while intubating, you have to maintain your CPP, ICP, and MAP. You have to avoid raises in ICP. Your patient positioning has to be correct. There would be reflex sympathetic response in a subset of patients, and you have to avoid hyperventilation. Careful attention to avoid hypotension, bolus prior to intubation, ketamine or etomidate in the right subset of patients if needed, and maintain normocapnia. Unsuccessful intubation, you should be ready with your LMAs or you should be uh, front of neck devices and your cricothyrotomy, you should be well versed with it. So decreasing ICP by decreasing cerebral blood flow sometimes works, but you know, maximal cerebral vasoconstriction at PCO2 of 20, less than 20, no further therapeutic benefit and may decrease cardiac preload and cardiac output. So we recommend ETCO2 monitoring and if prolonged use is required or necessary, special neuromonitoring to verify the cerebral blood flow is essential. You should also be careful about your metabolic acidosis and spontaneous hyperventilation of the brain injured patient. And there would be uh, special circumstances when the patients would be in ARDS. Uh, there would be barotrauma, uh, volumetric trauma, atelectic lungs, high FiO2s, and obviously high levels of circulatory cytokines. And what about sedation in this subset of patients? You know, it is a necessary evil. It obliterates the neurological examination, makes monitoring difficult, prolongs ventilation, but at the same time, it decreases your CMRO, ICP, and systemic metabolic stress. So it would be needed. So coming on to another subset of patients, another subset of emergencies would be cerebral vasospasm. All these topics have been touched or would be touched, but I would just uh, put a passing reference on these since I do have to discuss the neurological emergencies. They, all the topics are there uh, with the experts who discuss it in detail. So spasm, vasospasm is a leading cause of mortality and morbidity, around 17 to 40 percent of SAH patients have it. Uh, symptoms present between 4 to 12 days can be nonspecific or can be localized and also evaluate and rule out other things like hydrocephalus, electrolyte disturbances and seizures. Cerebral angiography remains the gold standard. Transcranial Dopplers and NIRS are something which can be done in tandem or can be done separately but multimodal monitoring would suggest that if you could use more than one monitors. TCDs uh, would be discussed, have been discussed. Uh, a good modality, bedside modality for uh, picking up vasospasm, uh, good for MCAs and ICAs. NIRS, more of a uh, tool for continuous monitoring, uh, uh, requires little clinical attention, optimum for patients who may be agitated and otherwise uncooperative. And NRIS has been shown to reliably assess global autoregulation in SH patients in a time-related fashion. Angiographic vasospasm is more common. Uh, Doppler sonography I've already touched upon. 
So treatment of vasospasm, as has been mentioned earlier as well, hypervolemia, induced hypertension, endovascular therapy is something which would be required. In our institute, uh, we have this protocol when the patient doesn't, uh, is not amenable to your IV or your NG therapy of nemodipine of with vasospasm. We are very aggressive on this and we would, sorry. We would go to step two where we would give intraarterial nemodipine and in the step step three we would aggressively give milrinone intraarterial and eventually we'll get the patient back on uh, IV milrinone and uh, nasogastric milrin, mil, uh, nemodipine. So we also tend to do continuous intraarterial dilatation uh, due to persistent vasospasm in our institute. Uh, where the patient would be having catheters and we'd be doing, giving continuous intraarterial uh, milrinone and uh, nemodipine to this subset of patients. So I'll not go into the details of the uh, hypertension and the blood pressure goals in SH. They have been discussed earlier. And uh, Dr. Padma has uh, discussed the hypertension and hypotension ischemic stroke. As per the newer guidelines, patient eligible for treatment with IV thrombolysis or other acute reperfusion interventions, the systolic blood pressure of 185 or diastolic of more than 110 should have BP lowered before intervention can be done. After reperfusion therapy, keep the systolic less than 180, your diastolic less than 105. A reasonable goal would be a 15% reduction and hypotensive patients the cause of hypotension should be sought and hypovolemia and cardiac arrhythmias should be treated and in exceptional circumstances, vasopressors may have to be given. What about hypertension in uh, ICH? So there are guidelines for that as well, published in 2015. If systolic blood pressure is more than 200 and MAPS more than 150, you have to manage the blood pressure aggressively. If it's more than 180 and the MAP above 180, consider monitoring ICP and reducing BP to keep cerebral perfusion pressure between 60 to 80 if your ICP is elevated. If your ICP is not elevated, consider uh, modest BP reductions to a MAP of 110 and a <coughs> blood pressure of around 160 by 90. So all these patients uh, who come to us uh, would also present with some sort of cardiovascular complication and cardiac dysfunction. SH, as has been discussed earlier, would present with 70% uh, of the patients would have ECG abnormalities or raised enzymes. 15 to 20% would have uh, low blood pressure. 15% would have pulmonary edema and around 10% would have Dysarrhythmia, spinal cord injuries would have uh, involvement of autonomic nervous system, bradycardias, tachycardias. Traumatic brain injury patients would have pulmonary edema or cardiac dysfunction. ICHS would have raised trop eyes and status patients would have some sort of arrhythmia. So neurogenic stunned myocardium and stress-induced uh, Takasubo cardiomyopathy is very common in patients with SH, severely depressed global cardiac function, especially the L, there is LV dysfunction, and the new term would be stress-related cardiomyopathy syndromes, uh, occurring within 24 hours and generally reversible would last up to seven days. What about hemorrhagic emergencies? Intracranial bleeds occur within 24 hours after administration of IV ectylase and uh, after treatment of stroke. So what do you do in this subset of patients? Because ultimately you'll be the people who'll be managing them in intensive care units. So what do you do? You stop ectylase. Obviously your basic investigations, a CT, basic bloods, cryoprecipitate, 10 units infused over 30, uh, over 30 minutes, tranexaminic acid, uh, aminocaproic acid if it is available. Obviously, you need to have your neurosurgeons on board and if need, a hematology help if required and supportive therapy including BP management, ICP, CPP and MAP. CT would solve 89% of your problems uh, with a sensitivity of 89% and specificity of 100%. Hematoma <laughs> volume can be calculated. Uh, <coughs> Just a few CT scans of this subset of patients. This is a patient of SH. Uh, 
So in addition, uh, sometimes you need to have to give contrast to this subset of patients. If you see the spot sign here, it's a dye extravasation which would give you a uh, hint or an idea of uh, a hematoma expansion where 60% of patients land up with a hematoma expansion. So acute management uh, suspected ICH often necessitates uh, emergent medical assessment. Uh, ICH checklist should obviously uh, <coughs> for the first hour would be your blood pressure, PT, APTT, INR, CT head, obviously your clinical GCS examination and your ICH scoring. So as we know, the majority, quite a few of these patients would be on anticoagulants, warfarin, the newer anticoagulants would be on antiplatelets because of various reasons. Uh, they present to us with ICH. So all your uh, armamentarium should be uh, with you and you should understand what to give when. Uh, just a brief chart of what should be given when. Uh, this would be discussed by Dr. Chavla in detail later, so I would not go into the details of this. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, you know, re sorry, reversal agents uh, for certain things. For certain things, obviously, you need to give your platelets and your desmopressin. And uh, so there are specific uh, reversal agents for, uh, obviously, heparin we all know, uh, warfarin, vitamin K, Fundaparinox and prax bind uh, for dabigatran. Uh, you, dabi, the, the reversal agent is very expensive, but if you are registered with the company, the company would give it to the patient free if you are registered with the company. So get all your patients on dabigatran registered. So we need to take the help of our surgical colleagues as well. Hydrocephalus complicates 50% of ICH patients. In retrospective review, ICP greater than 20 occurred in 70% of patients with ICH. So uh, obviously your EVDs uh, need to be placed in the ICU. You need to do appropriate drainage, uh, either continuous or uh, intermittent. But uh, we target around uh, 100 to 150 ml in 24 hours through the EVDs. Surgical interventions are necessary sometimes, so involve your surgical colleagues. I'll not go into the various trials. Certain patients with ICH may benefit from surgical evaluation of the uh, evacuation of the hematomas. So next variant of um, emergencies would face in ICUs would be seizures and their variants. Status epilepticus again would be discussed in detail this afternoon, but. I would just briefly touch upon it, say when seizures are prolonged or recurrent without a return to baseline, and most neurologists use an operational definition of any seizures lasting more than five minutes, or two or more seizures between which the patient does not return to the baseline to facilitate more timely and therefore more effective treatment. What about refractory status epilepticus? Irrespective of the time frame, status epilepticus that persists despite adequate administration of benzodiazepines and at least one AED is labeled as RSE. And what about the suprarefractory status epilepticus? Status epilepticus that continues or recurs 24 hours or more after the onset of anesthetic therapy, including those cases where epilepticus, uh, epilepsy occurs on the reduction or withdrawal of the anesthesia. So what are the agents we use? We all are familiar with thiopentone uh, advantages, we all know. Uh, it has neuroprotective effects, it lowers the core temperature, but disadvantages, obviously it's very long acting, uh, metabolism is slow, uh, causes hypotension, cardiorespiratory depression. Propofol we all use, uh, we know a propofol infusion syndrome, so we need to be careful of it while using, more than on, using it for more than 48 hours. Uh, ketamine again would be used in refractory and suprarefractory status epilepticus, uh, ND, NDMA receptors, it acts, uh, functions through the GABA receptors. Uh, two major advantages is not a cardiac depressant and is neuroprotective. Disadvantages would be positive sympath uh, sympathetomimetic action, late development of cerebral atrophy has been shown in one or two studies. So choice of anesthetic would depend on your departmental protocol, your, uh, uh, you know, what uh, is discussed between the critical care and the neurologist. 
Level of anesthesia is uh, obviously uh, continuous anesthesia to a level of birth suppression is required. Uh, present common practice is to aim for birth suppression initially and then in a prolonged episode to lighter the level of anesthesia. Reverse anesthesia initially for 24 to 48 hours. If seizures continue, re-establish it. The duration of individual cycles is increased over time and after a few weeks continued for five days uh, before attempts to reverse it is made. So this is something which we very uh, uh, commonly use in our intensive care for suprarefractory status epilepticus. Uh, inhalational uh, halogenated anesthetic, we use a lot of isoflurane. Uh, I would urge you if you have these patients, it works wonderfully well. Uh, there are very few case studies in this, but uh, you know the results are very encouraging. So the baseline EEG comes down within hours to uh, the status subsides and you get a baseline EEG within hours. So coming next, I can go on and on, uh, would be endocrinological emergencies, uh, generally relative adrenal insufficiency would be associated with head trauma. Clinical signs, if present, are uh, constitutional and vague. In an acute adrenal crisis, profound and refractory hypotension in addition to weakness and hypoglycemia. Random cortisol levels are fine in ICU because the diurnal variation is not there in intensive cares. Uh, other causes of hypotension and myocardial dysfunction or sepsis should be evaluated and ruled out. So treatment is obviously hydrocortisone or dexamethasone, normal saline or volume expansion in uh, balanced uh, crystalloids. Hypoglycemia should be treated and basic monitoring should be done. So uh, I would not touch upon the other uh, sodium and potassium abnormalities. I think uh, I can go on and on. I'd like you to, uh, like you all uh, juniors and the seniors to send their postgraduates for this problem-based learning course, which would be running in Medanta in July. All are welcome. And thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, sir. That was an excellent summary of how we manage our patients, all the neurological as well as neurosurgical emergencies. And due to paucity of time, I think we'll take the questions in the end, sir. Sure. Thank, thank you.